Oh, aloha. My name is Allison, and I work for the East My Watershed Partnership. Um, and this is a little infor information session about entering the Lama Baakua. Um, we had a live Zoom session, which I unfortunately forgot to record. So I am re recording myself um, right now to be able to post this for others to see. Um, but if you have questions and something I don't answer on here, uh, I am available at pr at eastmauiwatershed.org. Um, so to start, a little history of the exhibit is um, Malama Valakua. Malama actually means taking care of, and Valakua is the upper regions, the places where uh, the spirits would reside. And so this exhibit is really about these special places, even though it goes from mountain all the way to ocean, that we want to really take care of and have reverence for. So there is um, 20 years of history of Malama Vaakua. So currently it is at the Hui no Eau, uh, but 10 years prior to that, it was at Viewpoints Gallery in Makawao. So it started in 2004 and it actually skipped a year and they did a poetry slam. Um, and now we're celebrating 20 years of the exhibit, which is pretty amazing. And it's open to Maui County artists of all ages. So um, elementary school, middle school, high school, and adults. And you just have to be a resident of Maui, Lanai, or Molokai. And the main subject matter of the art piece has to be native to Maui Nui. So something that's native to Maui, Lanai, Molokai, or Koho'olawe. Um, it cannot be what we call endemic to another island um, and be entered into this exhibit. But things can be native to several islands. Um, so I've had some confusion on that before and I'll try to talk about that a little bit more as we go through. Um, so this will include any plant or animal from the mountain to near shore reef. So if you wanna look at a depth of about 150 to 200 feet um, and it should spend the majority of its life cycle in the near shore reef. So this is basically excluding animals that live in the deep ocean or what we call pelagic like whales, dolphins, jellyfish, and keeping things just on the near shore side of things. So here's some important dates um, for the exhibit. The exhibit itself will be open and on display at the Hui no Eau from September 13th to November 8th. There is going to be an opening event of the exhibit on September 13th. Um, online registration opens on Tuesday, August 20th. So Tuesday, August 20th, you'll be able to either go to the Hui Noyao exhibit website or malamavawakua.org website. Click on a link that will take you to a form to fill out to enter the exhibit. Um, then starting on August 27th, the entry fee will go up. So on August 20th, it's $10, I believe $10 per art piece, up to three pieces. And on the 27th, it will go up to $20 per art piece, up to three pieces. Um, but the kids division is $5 per art piece the whole time. So you go on, fill that out. Uh, once you get confirmation that you filled it out and made your payment on Tuesday, September 3rd, that's artwork receiving day. That's the day that you're actually gonna physically bring your artwork to the Hui no Eau and drop it off. And that will be from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. that day. Anytime during the day, um, you can drive up and we confirm that you've entered online and drop off your artwork. Um, then the next, over the course of the next day or two, during will take place. And then by Thursday, September 5th at 6 p.m., um, you will see a posting on, again, both the Hui Exhibitions website and malamavaokua.org of the pieces that were selected for the exhibit. If your piece is not listed on there, that means your piece was not selected and you'll need to go pick up your art piece on uh, that Friday. The websites are listed there on the bottom, so please visit those to get all this information again. Um, a little background about the East Valley Watershed Partnership. So. Like I said, we've been doing this exhibit for 20 years, but the East My Watershed Partnership has been around for way more than that. Uh, it was started in 1991. We have six partners, mostly landowners, which include uh, Haleakala Ranch, the state of Hawaii, Haleakala National Park, East Maui Irrigation, the Nature Conservancy, and the County of Maui. 
Now the County of Maui is not a land holding partner, but because as you can see by that map there, we are working to protect large tracts of land on the east side of Maui, which are home to many of our rare and endangered species, as well as one of the largest recharge areas for our water supply. They are also a partner. And so some of the major things that we do, we are not artists, so to speak, but what we do is we protect these native rainforests. We build fences to keep out hooved animals that don't belong there, removing invasive species inside of those fences. And then we try to do a lot of outreach and education in the community. So we're not the only watershed partnership. Um, there are two other ones on Maui, and then there are a total of 10 throughout the whole state, but we were the first one. <laughs> so this idea is spread. So these are basically partnerships where people are, are doing large scale conservation work, kind of crossing lots of boundaries so we can all work together for a common goal. So why do we care? Why are we doing this exhibit? Why do we care about these watershed areas? Well, obviously they're a source of water. You know, we're living on an island and we only have so much fresh water. And so since these native forested areas are a source of fresh water, we need to make sure they're healthy and functioning properly. Also biodiversity. 90% of Hawaii's native flowering plants exist here and nowhere else in the world. Okay, we have some of the best reefs in the world. And um, for example, about 0.5% of the seafloor is represented, but we have 25% of the mar world's marine species. So we really have a great representation of biodiversity in our marine life and in our uh, terrestrial forested ecosystems. And so we want to represent those and bring awareness to that. And also culturally, Polynesians use a lot of the things that are found in these natural environments to practice their culture. And if they are starting to disappear, then that can't be done. So this is just kind of a nice quote that I really liked that talks about how the plants and animals that came here came in small numbers, okay? And when they were here and they were kind of isolated on their own, they really adapted to specifically to this little niche of an ecosystem that they landed in. And from that, they started to evolve in this elegant equilibrium with all the things around it, you know, whether that meant losing chemical mechanical defenses um, or gaining a uh, property that they didn't have before that might help out a fellow plant or animal that lived nearby, okay? So they developed this symbiotic relationship dependent on each other for food and pollination and seed dispersal. And so the history of these native species is really quite unique in how they were like created into this web of life that depended on each other. And unfortunately now today with a lot of human introductions, all of that web and ecosystem uh, dependency is starting to fracture. So for example, here you have a map and we're not looking specifically at the colors, but just whether it's colored or not. So like the deep blue is like a coastal ecosystem versus the teal is like an alpine. And it's just showing areas that were native dominant plant communities before human arrival, okay? And we're just kind of using this to compare with what the same map looks like today. 75% okay. of the area that looked the way it did when Polynesians just came up on the canoes and the shorelines is lost. And most of that's where we're living today. So what's around your house or your place of work or business doesn't look the way it did when people first got here. And most of the places that still do are way high. They're not accessible. They're areas that we're working to protect, but also not something people see all the time. And so another thing about this exhibit is kind of taking the intangible and making it tangible. Taking these native plants and animals from places where people can't always visit and see them, um, and they're not always right outside their front door, but bringing it to a place where they can look at them and understand them and view them in a way that they can connect with them. So some important terms are basically native and non-native. Uh, that's what this whole exhibit's about, is native species. But what is a native species, right? So native species are things that are naturally occurring in an area without the help of humans. So it came on its own via wings. So that means birds, either on the bird or in its belly, through the wind or air currents, uh, by blowing over here or flying. 
uh, by water, by either floating on the water, like on a log or swimming here, okay? So these plants and animals came over very slowly. They had a, quite a long journey to get here. And when they arrived, they were kind of the only one here for a while until the next one came. And so they were able to adapt specifically to the local climate, the geographical and hydro hydrological conditions, um, and really just, again, had that started to create that symbiotic relationship with new things coming because they had time to adapt to one another. Now, what also happened is once those things got here, some of them changed to match that environment so much that they became a new species. And that's where the term endemic comes from. It means now that it's found only here and nowhere else in the world. And then the other term is indigenous, means, hey, it got here on its own, but you know what? It just didn't change from where it came from. So it still lives over there and it's found there, but it also lives here now too, okay? So those are the two different terms within the word native, endemic and indigenous. So if you see that it's endemic or indigenous, that would qualify for the show. You just have to make sure that it's not endemic to a, an island that's not a part of Maui Nui, okay? So then the other term is not native. And this is something that was brought here, you know, either purposely or not purposely via ship, airplane, like either I brought that plant over purposely to plant in my yard or on that plant, there was another seed or an insect that I didn't mean introduce, but now it's here. Um, this also includes Polynesian introduced or canoe plants. So a lot of people think Kalo, for instance, is native. That was something that was brought here by the Polynesians for food and is not considered native. So here we are, an isolated island chain. And like we said, things had to get here on their own to be native. So by the wind, by water, or the wings. And again, that adaptive radiation where one became many is really unique to Hawaii. And you'll see that a lot in our native forest birds. So they're called the honey creepers, where one bird turns into over 50 different types of forest birds. Unfortunately, many of them have gone extinct. Um, and in, on this image here, you can see there is like a little scraggly um, bush here in the middle. That is the ancestor to the silver sword, which now lives on Haleakala. But it has a relative, which is the green sword, uh, which a lot of people don't realize, um, that lives more in wet habitats. So again, same ancestor, but depending upon where it was on the island, it basically... Uh, went from one place or the other. So if it came over here with the help of humans, it's not native. So at the Malama Valakua website um, or mwa-art.org, if that's easier, there is a great page called the Artist Resources page. Uh, I invite you to go to that. There you will find books that you could get from your library. You will find links to websites to research species. You will find some YouTube videos that are inspiring. You'll find places to visit throughout the islands um, to see native species. So I do encourage you to, to check that out. Um, the other thing you need to know is when you are looking up a species, uh, it can, can be confusing because a lot of things have three names. So my example here is the silver sword. Uh, there's the common name, silver sword, that most of us know it by. There's a Hawaiian name, a hina hina or hina hina, which means gray gray. And Hawaiian names sometimes can cover multiple species. So any plant that was gray was called a hina hina. So that could be sometimes confusing. But then there's the scientific name. And this is the very like exact name that, you know, nothing else can be named this if it's not that same plant. Um, and so, for instance, with the silver sword plant that we know here on Haleakala, its genus species name is Agrosium sandwichense. Now, there's a subspecies here that's endemic to Haleakala, and there's a subspecies that's endemic to Mauna Kea, and there's a whole other um, species, Cowense, which is endemic to Mauna Loa. So, hopefully it doesn't confuse you too much, but I'm just wanting you to know that when you're looking something up, you'll see three different names that it could have. And as long as you know one of those, usually you can kind of get enough research to get the scientific name out of it, which is what we're going to ask you for on the entry form. Now, the second part of this is, is it native to Maui Nui? Okay. That's where you're going to want to look up the natural range of that plant or animal. So for instance, this is one of my favorite books, Hawaii's Native Plants. I can look up a plant uh, by looking in the glossary in the back. 
And then in the back, um, I will find the page that it's on, look it up. And here I can see on here, it says Net Hawaiian range. And that END stands for endemic. And then after it, it has an initial of some sort. And that is standing for the islands that it is found. So depending upon which species, there's one that's endemic to Maui, Lanai, one that's endemic to Maui and Molokai. And so as long as it has one of the Maui Nui Islands listed, it would be acceptable. And again, if you need confirmation, please email me at pr at eastmywatershed.org to um, confirm if you'd like. This is another great website. Again, this is on the artist resources page, but you can look up species here and find out the distribution of them um, and some more information about the name, pictures. This is another great website I like to use for pictures a lot. Um, not everything on there is native, but this has a whole host of pictures so you can see like a habitat of a species or different angles or something if you're painting something. Um, these are some common mistakes we get. Uh, often people like to enter hibiscus flowers because they're just beautiful. But if you're entering a white hibiscus, there's only one white hibiscus we're going to accept. And that is the hibiscus arenatus subspecies immaculatus, which is endemic to the island of Molokai. Now, this other one that you see is found everywhere on Maui. It's a common landscaping plant, but it actually is not native to uh, Maui. It's endemic to other islands and not here. So it's cultivated and put out here everywhere, but is not considered native to Maui Nui. And so if you enter uh, artwork with a red stamen versus a white stamen, we're gonna know that you actually were entering the wrong species of hibiscus. Um, Another one is the hibiscus coquillo. There is one that is endemic to Kauai, which is very orange in color. So again, if you enter hibiscus coquillo and it's very orange, we're going to know that you have painted the wrong one, and that one is not native to here. So on the Malau Valakua art show, um, frequently asked questions artist is on the re artist resources page. We actually list out which hibiscus are acceptable for the exhibit. Okay. Other common questions we get is um, reef sharks are accepted, extinct plants. So it ha doesn't have to be here it could, as long as it was known to have been here. We get this a lot with our bird species, okay? That's okay to enter something extinct. Uh, we don't accept coconut palms, but we have native palms called lolu palms and um, they're beautiful. So if you wanna include a palm, you can use that. But not accepted are again, those open ocean creatures like whales, dolphins, jellyfish. Uh, coconut trees, kalo, and then um, there's some questionable things like anything where no one's really sure, but uh, we ask that those maybe not be your main um, subject matter, and that's how in Milo. Our jurors this year are a great combination of Mike, Michael Takimoto, sorry, his name's spelt wrong on my slide here, but he is the visual artist and professor of art at the University of Hawaii Maui College, and then we also have Kat Louie, who is the predecessor of me at East Maui Watershed Partnership and actually the person that had the original idea of this exhibit. So she actually currently lives in Oregon and is flying out here to um, jury the show. We do have several awards that are in the exhibit. Um, so for adults, the jurors will pick a juror's choice and honorable mention. Each one of them get to choose their own. And then together they will work to pick um, their juror's choice in the three cakey divisions of elementary, middle, and high school. And then we have special awards, like the Dr. Fern P. Duval Rarest Find Award. And the jurors will basically go through the exhibit, see some of the rarest things that were entered, and from that, choose their selection. There's also something called the Art of Conservation. This is the artwork that shows conservation best. And this is where there's a little leeway where invasive species could be in your artwork if you're trying to show how conservation is, is maybe helping with that. And then we also have the People's Choice Award, which is voted throughout the exhibit by people that visit the gallery. And we do have awards, um, prizes for these awards too. So we've been having several artists who are throughout the exhibit um, or artist adventures. Most of them have kind of ended, but there are a few still. Um, this one we just added a couple of weeks ago. It's already full, but it's this Saturday. So uh, you'd have to sign up real quick and get on a wait list. Um, this is next Tuesday. Again, it's full um, waitlist only, but it is still the available. 
Uh, we have about five spots available for this to the Maui Ocean Center. Uh, we actually go through the exhibit about a half hour before it opens to the public. And the naturalists will talk about native and endemic uh, reef species. They'll go through a tour of the whole thing, but really only the eligible stuff will be in the first part of the tour, but they will tour you through the whole um, uh, aquarium. I highly suggest going to Maui Nui Botanical Gardens. They have free admission, and then they have a really great app you can download or a website you can visit. And it has all the different plants at the botanical garden on it. And every plant that's acceptable for the exhibit will have our Lomavao Kua logo on top of it. So it's a great way to go there, or send kids there and be like, hey, everyone that has a, a logo for the exhibit on there, you can take a picture or paint and, and enter it in the show. So other ideas of places to visit that have native species, um, the Wailea Boardwalk is a really great one that a lot of people don't know about. So you, it runs from like Polo Beach all the way to like the Grand Wailea. And there's a lot of native species in there, um, have cards that talk about them even so you can see the names of them. Um, other ideas are to volunteer with other conservation groups um, and then talk to the person that's running the, the volunteer trip. Um, you could probably learn a lot. Go to the library. They have a lot of great books. They have a whole Hawaiiana section in the back, which includes native plants and species. Visit the botanical gardens. Um, social media now. All of these conservation groups have social media platforms and share a lot of information about different things that they're working on or species, whether it be birds or plants or snails. Um, so follow those and learn a lot that way. So we do this year for the first time have a Instagram account for Malama Balakua. So please follow it. And because it's our 20th year, we're really asking people to um, kind of just share their own stories, emotions and connections they've had with the exhibit. And that means your first year to like, hey, I've been entering for the last 20 years. Uh, we just wanna know how this exhibit has affected people from the artist to somebody visiting to whatever it may be. I, maybe I danced hula one time or I was a teacher teaching my kids. Um, but we wanna get these stories and try to collect them by people posting or recording video and then using the hashtag pound MWA influence. And then we'll kind of collect them in one place or reshare them to kind of capture all that, that great history that the exhibits had. So again, here's the important dates. Um, Exhibit dates run from September 13th to November 8th. Uh, online registration opens on the 20th, receiving days on the 3rd. Um, also, uh, one question we had during the info session that was live was, um, I did talk about that when you register, register online, you'll be asked to upload a photo of your artwork. This is not used for during. This is basically to look at your species that you're entering and your artwork to make sure that it's eligible. Um, there is room for artistic interpretation. It doesn't have to be exact. And, um, but it's just to kind of make sure that, that it is eligible prior to, to jurying. Everything gets juried live after it's been entered. Um, so the images are not used for jurying in any way. And your artwork doesn't even have to be finished when you post that picture. So good to know. And I think that's it. If you have any other questions, please email me at pr at eastmaiwatershed.org. And if it has to do with any questions more about like hanging artwork and size and dimensions, that kind of stuff, please contact the Huino Yao. Thank you so much. Stop the recording now. <laughs>